So here we go, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Insight Series, the show where I get the lowdown on town's newest recruits. And of course, town have signed George Hurst on loan for the season from Leicester City. I'm joined, first of all, by Andrew Moon, the man who com- commentates on Pompey. And also I'm going to be joined by Rich Sharp, who covers all things Blackburn later on in the video. Uh, Andrew, um, George spent time on loan at Pompey last season. Had a pretty good spell, actually, overall. 15 goals in 46 games in all competitions. Um, First of all, overall thoughts on his you know, deal to sign for town for the rest of the season? I look at Ipswich and I, I already think they had the best team and maybe the best squad in the division. And now to add someone as good as George Hurst as, as well, it, it honestly goes back to the, the almost the only thing I could stop Ipswich going up is have they almost got too many players? Because... Uh, yeah, you're probably too young for a reference of did did Espria joining Newcastle in '96 uh, thwart their title campaign? I think that's always a cliche. I don't know how true it is, but you almost worry: are there are there too many players to keep happy? Because you just look at the quality, and it it is so strong throughout the team. And I didn't ever look at their their striking line and think, oh, that's a bit weak. So, yeah, it's Ipswich look very, 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 very strong. They did before; they look even stronger now. Hurst's time at Portsmouth was interesting because it was very much a season of two halves. Really struggled in the start, the first half of the season. To be honest, in mid-November, I think there was a chance he would have been sent back in January. Then it all changed on one night. There was an EFL trophy game against Crystal Palace under 21s, that much maligned competition, where he played really, really well, and he scored an injury time goal, which sent Pompey through to the next round. They had been heading out, and he scored in injury time. So... From then on, he looked a different player. And the second half of the season, he might have been the best player in the team. So it it wasn't a surprise when he made the jump up to the championship after leaving Portsmouth. Pompey fans would have loved to have had him back. And there were even conspiracy theories when the new kit was launched that was the hand tapping the badge, George Hurst's hand. Obviously, it wasn't. I don't think George Hurst's hand are that uh, that notable. But yeah, Pompey fans would have loved him back this season uh, and it it would be sad it didn't happen yeah definitely I can't remember much of his time against town because he played against us both in the the, both games the nil nil at Port Road and of course the four nil at Fratton Park Um, but give us a lowdown on what he can add to town as a player you know he can score goals Um, you know he's he's a promising young striker because Leicester City wouldn't have given him a new deal and wouldn't be at a Premier League club if he wasn't good Um, but yeah what can he add to the town squad yeah, he's got good physical attributes. He's what six foot three. He's pretty tall. He's strong. He's when he gets up, gets going. He's quick. He can come short. He can look to get on the end of crosses, but he can also be quite direct and really try and turn and run at centre halves. And it's it's that kind of play that really gets people going and and gets them on their feet and that that excitement. But he's a striker who's capable of scoring all kinds of goals. Perhaps not quite to his to his dad's quality, who was obviously a, a top Premier League player, but he, he definitely is a striker who's got so many attributes and skills that you feel he's too good to be playing playing in League One. Yeah, and we, we spoke off air quickly about um, his partnership with Marcus Harness. Um, I think he got, got three assists from Marcus Harness for his goals, but overall, you know, what was that like? Well, it was kind of interesting because they were on opposite trajectories last season. So the first half, her struggled and Harness was probably the the best player and then the second half Harness struggled and Hurst really came to sort of his his form so they were never really on fire at the same time but look you you know what having someone like Harness behind someone like Hurst is is gonna is gonna cause problems for defences and we saw at Fratton Park back in the end of December that, that the Chaplin Harness behind a striker that is you would think a, a pretty much a dream for a number nine to have two players of that quality playing in the gap behind you. Definitely, mate. And um, let's talk about him as a character then. He's, he's a young lad. Um, I watched his interview and, you know, I thought he we sort of came across really well. What was your interactions like when you interviewed him before or after a game? Yeah, I interviewed him a few times. Just just always very, very polite and friendly to the media and, and always just quite happy to chat as well. Some people... Some players are better at doing interviews than others. He was always good to speak to. I remember speaking to him after that Palace game, and it was really nice because you could just tell how genuinely chuffed and delighted he was to finally get that first Pompey goal, and and he would then go and kick on from there. So 
a really nice character. And obviously, my co-commentator, Guy Whitting, used to play up front with his dad, uh, David Hurst, for Sheffield Wednesday. So Guy would speak to his dad a, a, about him. And you, you'll see David Hurst rock up, I'm sure, at, at Portman Road a few times to watch him. But yeah, likeable character. He'll fit in well with the dressing room. And it's just the kind of signing that when you're, when you're up there, if you can make that in January, can really, I, I think, help you kick on and get automatic promotion. Definitely, mate. We shall wait and see. Well, thank you very much for the insight and lowdown. Any other business, any other notes you want to add? Well, the only other thing to say is just that, obviously, Danny Cowley sacking does potentially alter things for Joe Piggott at Portsmouth. Yeah. Now, we don't know who the new manager's going to be as yet. They're keeping their cards quite close to the chest. I think it's more likely to be a young coach than an experienced manager. But whereas Piggott might have been looking for a new club, he may now be thinking, well, hold on, new manager might be a change, might be a new opportunity. So we'll have to wait and see with that one. But whereas I think it was possible that if there'd been another club interested, Piggott might have gone somewhere else. I, I think we'll, that, that, that is less clear now. OK, then we shall wait and see then, my friend. Well, thanks for joining me as ever. Let's cross over to good old Rich Sharp to get some insight on his spell at Blackburn. OK, then. Next up, I'm joined by Rich Sharp, the man who covers all things Blackburn Rovers for Lancashire Telegraph. Rich, thanks very much for joining me, first of all. Um, George Hurst spent the first half of this season at Blackburn in the Championship. Um, what are your thoughts, first of all, on him joining town? No, no real surprise. I think this has been on the cards for, for a while, to be honest. Um, he signed for Rovers on uh, the day before deadline day on a season long loan, which actually included an option for Rovers to buy. Uh, they also did look at trying to do a permanent uh, signing, but Leicester were keen to time down to a new contract. So there was a bit of a compromise struck there. But yeah, never really worked it out for him, to be honest. Uh, and I think when it came to January, it was just a case of working out how the deal could work because it wasn't as straightforward that Rovers couldn't send him back. So I think if Leicester were going to recall him, there had to be an option for him elsewhere. And I think that's where Ipswich came in. And between all three clubs, I think they've pretty much worked together to, to get this deal over the line. And I think it's in the best interest of everyone, really. I think when Rovers made clear that he wouldn't be playing much in the second half of the season and another team were, were keen to use him. I think, like I said, it was best for, for George mainly, but also Leicester and for Rovers now to, to go out there and see what they can get to strengthen their uh, their attacking ranks. Indeed, yeah. So, 11 appearances um, this season. Only two league starts, no goals. Um, he has played in the Championship before when he was at Rotherham um, in the Championship when they were there. And, of course, he didn't score a goal for them, but um, didn't play as that much. But with what you've seen of him, what what what, what sort of player is he? And um, 11 appearances, you know, he's probably not enough to really know what his good things and bad things are. Yeah, well, I think he made he came in, like I said, just on deadline day and, and was thrust straight into the team at home to Bristol City, played as the number nine. Uh, and I think that's probably where he's fallen down at Rovers is they've, they've rarely in the, the last few seasons played with an out-and-out -out number nine. So I think when he signed, it was quite, quite difficult from that point to think of, you know, where he would fit in. But equally, they've got a new head coach in Yondal Thomason. So I think the thought was that, you know, maybe that they'd play a bit of a different way. But with Burton and Gallagher, who were the the two play like wide forwards, really, not not really an out and out number nine. So he played there against Dan as well. Um, he's very enthusiastic, um, likes to to put himself about, but it really just never came off for him. Um, he missed a penalty, or well, sorry, it saved in the last minute against Cardiff. Uh, speaking to the manager yesterday, I think he thought that was a bit of a a crucial moment, really. If that had gone in, he'd have got that championship duck off his back and could have probably kicked on from there. But I think. He's, Rovers played two friendlies during the World Cup break. Um, he scored twice in one of them against Hearts, a really good volley and, and running in behind and spoke to him after that. And I think he'd seen that as a real reset, a chance for him to, you know, look at what's worked and what's not worked. And, you know, Rovers trying to get the best out of him. And I, I think the thought that would be a bit of a turning point, but the return from action, again, it, it didn't really feature. But I think for a big lad, his mobility is good. Um, he's able to, to stretch teams. So, I think as well as playing with his back to goal, he, he does like to run in behind. And that was one of the goals he scored against Hearts was a, was a ball in behind. He, he ran round at the keeper and scored. The other one was, was a brilliant volley. Um, but yeah, I, I think his mobility, you know, for a lad who is six foot three, six foot four, does, is, is quite striking. But I think really the situations he was thrust in at Rovers, um, who've not got any points from when they've gone behind in games. So, you know, it's, it's been a real struggle for him. Um, 
but he's obviously cracked it in League One before and he was talking to him when I spoke to him in the break that it was the second half of the season at Portsmouth where he, where he really kicked on and he was looking to use that as a bit of inspiration for Rovers and, and while it won't be Ewood Park but he'll be doing that I'm sure that's probably what he's looking to do at Ipswich Indeed, yeah. It's, um, it's a shame it didn't work out at Blackburn, but now he's got a fresh start um, with Richard Town. Of course, Kieran McKenna was um, trying to get him in the summer, but then didn't happen and he joined Blackburn on loan. And then, yeah, it just didn't work out. But um, yeah, we shall wait and see. Oh, well, Rich, um, thanks so much for joining me. Any other business, any other notes on on George Hurst? He, he seems like a young lad that wants to just, you know, kick on. Of course, he's got that, his dad being a, a Sheffield Wednesday legend and, you know, played a lot of football, of course. Um, I'm sure he's got that behind him a little bit. But yeah, big future ahead of him, hopefully. Yeah, from speaking to him about that, I don't think he sees that as a burden. I think he sees why, you know, if you've got a dad who, who's been there and done it, he, he leans on him and he said he spoke to him during the break about, you know, things it can do. So while everybody, you know, would speak to a parent in such situations, you know, to have somebody like that to lean on. But he, he is a really good lad. Um, he speaks really well. He, he comes across well. So I think um, there'll be no hard feelings from anybody at Rovers. It's just a case that it didn't work out and... Now they need to go and look to find themselves another attacking option. And I don't think George would have been short of options. But like I said, I, I do think it would have would have come in League One where he's had success before. Definitely, mate. Well, thanks for joining me. Um, thanks, everyone, for watching another Insight video. And bye-bye for now.